Cool. Okay. Two fifteen. Let's do this. I have module number 10, which means after this, we have five more lectures to go. As always, a quick picture for the week, a Sonic drive-in blue screen. Looks like uh, Windows 7 to me. This week's talk is about mobile devices and similar devices. Uh, knowing is half the battle, so being well aware of what mobile devices are on your network and or using your resources is highly important in today's organizations. As cybersecurity professionals, we have to keep devices such as tablets, smartphones, wearable technology, laptops, and web-based computers like Chrome OS in mind that these devices can connect through various methods from cellular, satellite, infrared, and USB. These different communications allow devices to always be connected, but can provide attackers with multiple ways to enter a, to enter a secured network through these devices. In an enterprise, we have a couple of deployment methods most commonly named and used. Uh, this list, the bring your own device, corporate owned, personally enabled, choose your own, virtual desktop, and corporate owned. Some benefits for bring your own device, uh, for corporate owned, personally enabled, and choose your own are BOID and CYOD, ease management burden by eliminating the need to select a wireless data carrier and manage plans for employees. Businesses do not need to monitor billing for overages or extra charges. Businesses can offer stipend for BY or CYOD, which is less than the device and the plan. Employees tend to be more productive with the device they like. Since devices are already online, IT doesn't have to get extra infrastructure. Uh, BYOD, COPE, and CYOD Users need to contact their carrier support before contacting the business's IT support for help. Of course, as with everything, there are some downsides. For example, uh, with mobile devices, well, they're mobile, so they are easily stolen. A lot of devices have limited firmware updates. Mobile devices are built to support a certain OS version, and then it's time to buy a new device in order to stay current. Some vendors have their own version of Android, which makes getting updates from Google even slower, leaving more devices unprotected. There's location tracking. There's misconfigured apps who have way too many permissions and malware that can leak geolocation information, causing an increased risk of a targeted physical attack. And there's also unauthorized recording. As with location tracking, malware and misconfigured apps can quietly capture audio and video, among other data. There's also issues with connections like tethering. An affected system can propagate malware and that includes phones. There's the USB on the go. Malware can spread from computer to device and then device to another computer and so on and so forth. And connecting to public networks, attackers can eavesdrop on data transmissions and view sensitive information. If they're able to break it, if they're able to communicate, especially the communication that's happening without proper security. There's also accessing untrusted content, like QR codes. Attackers can post QR codes on top of legitimate ones to get users to take a picture and redirect them to malware or malicious or fake sites. There's routing. By gaining root access to a mobile device, users can install any application. This also means that the root user is unlocked 
and is typically not set with a password, allowing attackers in with ease. And it is totally possible to send malware in an MMS message or send links to untrusted content via SMS. There's deployment model risks. Users may erase installed limitations by jailbreaking or rooting the device. Personal mobile devices are shared with others and can expose sensitive corporate information to outsiders. Different devices have different hardware and operating systems. So tech support has to be able to manage hundreds of different devices and configurations. Mobile devices that are infected can infect the organization when connected to local computers. And it is difficult to erase a personal smartphone from an employee who was using it for business use, who then leaves the company. They could end up walking out with sensitive corporate information. This is not a best practice. <laughs> uh, as with any device, disable unused features. Turn off anything that's unnecessary or unused, like Bluetooth when you're not using it. Use strong authentication. You're setting a string lock with an extended out uh, lockout period and reset to factory after a number of failed attempts. Pins are easy to compute. Biometrics has an asterisk. Yes, you could use it, uh, but also know that if law enforcement gets a hold of it, they can force the user to unlock it. Biometrics is also not foolproof. If you're using a swipe pattern, educate users to clean their screens to prevent attackers from seeing the residue and easily deducing the pattern. Most new devices are already fully encrypted, but don't just assume it, always check. Ensure that the device is fully encrypted to prevent uh, data from being read if in case it is stolen. Data in transit should always be protected. Cloud storage should be closely monitored. Um, there is a solution of segmenting storage or have a set, having a separate location where company data is stored on the device. And enable loss of theft, loss or theft services. These services can force the device to erase all data should it be stolen. At your disposal, there are mobile management tools that provide onboarding, offboarding of devices that modify settings, approve or quarantine new devices, erase data, configure phone per organization policies that can control and distribute apps to devices and support editing and modification of digital content by multiple employees. So you are not necessarily stuck alone and have to figure it all out. There are tools available to you. For example, Google has one and Apple has one as well that you can leverage. Now switching gears from mobile devices to embedded systems and Internet of Things. Embedded systems are everywhere from HVACs to SCADA systems, uh, supervisory control and data acquisition, to industrial control systems, or ICS. These technologies appear in our cars, in our grocery stores, in our oil pumps, in our power grids, and space communications. Many of these systems run system on a chip, or SOC, or also use real-time operating systems, or RTOS. In either case, these systems don't have any means for any features outside of what they're built to do. 
security features have to be built around these devices. For example, if you have a HVAC unit, is there a firewall? Are there settings to control the, uh, the communications? Usually not really. Maybe there's a, a thermometer and maybe there's a digital thing to click on or not to click on, but to tap on and set. But when have you seen a, uh, a network security configuration for them? You rarely do. No, our, uh, our ways of getting power, for example, are ever more connected on the internet. And here's an example of wastewater SCADA, which again is connected to the internet to handle wastewater. And some, uh, some industry does install things like firewalls to blog, but generally the actual devices that do the work don't have any measure to secure themselves whatsoever. So you have to you have to realize that there are systems that are completely defenseless, but also are critical. So how do you secure those while maintaining while knowing that these things in and of themselves are in, in no way secure? There is also, just to add more to it, the Internet of Things. This is any device that did not have network access previously, like thermostats, coffee makers, tire sensors, slow cookers, keyless entry systems, washing machines, electric toothbrushes, headphones, light bulbs, body sensors, EKG, hearing, and so on and so on and so on and so on. Uh, the fridge that's connected to the internet, does that have any security measures installed? More than likely not. The smart toaster definitely does not have any means for security. Yet those are being brought into our offices, brought into our networks, and pose a legitimate threat because those are easy to get into, easy to pivot from and do mayhem to the rest of the network. Especially as we're getting out of this pandemic and folks are starting to return to work and turn to offices, they're gonna bring some of their home stuff with them. And these are new things that we have to keep watch over that we need to uh, make sure that they don't just randomly creep into our network and cause mayhem. We have to be aware of them, have to secure them or find ways to kick them out or if they're legitimate, how are they gonna work on our network and not be a threat? All fun things to think about. More, more things to keep you up at night, but honestly, it's just, it's more job security for us because we have to figure these things out. And uh, to me, this is a whole lot of fun because I like to find new ways of of uh, how, how will this thing cause trouble? And let's make sure that it can cause trouble. And then all right now, how do we fix it so that it doesn't cause trouble? Any questions? Okay, seeing none, I'll stop this recording. Make this into a quick video. And then we'll make a quick video of the lab. So for lab work this week, 
there is really one main thing to do. Uh, it is really surrounding the Try Hack Me Android Hacking 101 book, or 101 uh, room. You have a number of things to do in this, it has 11 tasks. It is a free room. So you should be able to uh, log in and knock it out. As always, you prove that you completed the room. When you're done with that room, then you can check out the OWASP mobile top 10. And you can write a simple report. It doesn't have to be uh, 10 pages, 50 pages. I'm not asking for something like that. Honestly, just detailing what you saw in the top 10 room, in the top 10 uh, site with the Try Hack Me room. Um, and so as you go through all this, see the, the top 10 mobile risks that exist. And honestly, did you see this in any proper platform uses? Did you see insecure data storage? Did you see these in this? And um, what you think of it? It doesn't, again, it doesn't have to be a complex, long document. It's just really uh, a reflection of the work you did here compared to what OAuth says are the top 10 risks for mobile put together. Any questions on the work this week? Okay, seeing no questions, I'll stop the recording and end the stream. Uh, feel free to reach out on Discord if you do have any.